Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William. And featuring Carlton Young and Howard Culver with an all-star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is Warren William bringing you the story, So Deep the Stream. But first, here's a brief message from your announcer. Now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in So Deep the Stream. Many people leave strange legacies. One man in Oregon left a trunk full of government bonds to his wife. Another strange character in Chicago left a safety deposit box full of cash, $3 million in gold notes. My client and good friend, Frank Warner, left a most unusual legacy to his son, Evan. But it wasn't gold, negotiable stocks or bonds. He left him a challenge. It was a sweltering summer night when I stopped off to see Frank on my way home. He lived on the lower east side of the city. Let's see. 3A, 3B. Oh, here it is, 3C. Frank Warner. Come in. By the beard of Shakespeare, if it isn't my good friend, John O'Connell. Come in, come in, you misguided thespian. <laughs> <laughs> well, here I am, Frank. But you certainly picked a scorcher for our get-together. Now, isn't that just like a lawyer? Always worrying about the temperature or some other irrelevant, inconsequential and immaterial matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you're right. After all, what's a temperature of 101 between friends? Ah, that's the way I like to hear you talk. Especially when there's work to be done. Work? On a night like this? Oh, no, Frank. Let's just sit here and talk and maybe reminisce a bit. Later, later, my fine-feathered friend. But first, I have news for you. Bad news. Another one of your plays turned down, Frank? That, sir, would be only a temporary setback. What I have to tell you now will be permanent. John, I was over to the clinic on 68th Street this afternoon. I'm going to die. Die? Die? Oh, come now. Don't joke about a thing like that. I'm not joking, John. It's the solemn truth. That's why I asked you to stop on your way home. John, my batting average on Broadway hasn't been very good, as you well know. I've told you many times, Frank, that you've lived 50 years too soon. Your plays are too daring, your philosophy too advanced. You see that trunk over there in the corner, John? <laughs> you've told me before that it's the morgue for your manuscript. That's right. Inside are over 60 potential Broadway hits. Not for today, maybe, but ready for the world of tomorrow. Someday, John, this tired old world will have to realize that all men are brothers. I'm afraid that won't happen overnight, Frank. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Things are moving swiftly in this old world of ours, John. But let's get down to the practical side. I have one son, as you know, Evan. He's the only one I have left in the world. And one of the nicest young men I know, too. He's a fine lad, that's true. And for better or for worse, I've steeped his mind with my philosophy. He's going to carry on as a playwright, going to produce my shows. He graduates this year from college, doesn't he? And with the highest honors. But outside of his education, I haven't much to leave him. Except... Except what, Frank? Except that trunk full of manuscripts and the fanatical belief that one day those plays will help make this world a better place in which to live. Oh. What does he think of your plays? He believes in them. 
so much so that he has sworn to me that he will devote his life to seeing that they are produced. The contents of that trunk, John, have become our religion. So be it. I want you to draw up my will, leaving my trunk and its contents to Evan. Today, it's without value. Tomorrow? Well, who knows, John? Who knows? Frank Warner died two years later, while Evan was studying in Paris. His funeral carried little notice in the press, but the church was filled to capacity with old and new friends who had known him. Overalled workmen carrying lunch boxes sat next to and rubbed elbows with gentlemen in silk top hats. As I sat there and looked at the people, I wondered if Frank's philosophy of universal brotherhood hadn't borne fruit. Somehow the thought occurred to me that within the confines of this solemn old church, men and women, high-born and low-born, were gathering to do humble homage at the beer of a brilliant mind. Was this the beginning of reason and understanding? I wondered. Hello? John, is that you, John? Yes? This is Evan, Evan Warner. Why, Evan, good heavens. I'm glad to hear your voice again. How long have you been home? Just flew in this morning. It's sure swell to be back. And it's nice to have you here, too, Evan. When can you come over to see me? We've got quite a few things to talk over. I'll come over tomorrow night. I'll even go on better. How about dinner? That would be suit me fine. What time? We'll make it, how about eight? Okay, dinner at eight tomorrow night at the Waldorf. It's a deal. And say, John. Yes, Evan? Keep your fingers crossed for me tonight, will you? Fingers crossed? What do you mean? I've got a date with Polly. You remember Polly McGuire, my old friend? <laughs> you bet I remember Polly. I think she's wonderful. What's up? I'm going to take her over to our old rendezvous, that little cafe over on 54th Street. Uh -huh. Everything looks like it used to, and she still has that same old feeling. I'm going to pop the question. <laughs> So, there you are, Polly. That's my story and my future. How about it, honey? Well, I don't know what to say, Evan, really. I've waited for you this long. I guess a little while longer won't hurt anyone. But, Evan, do you really have to try producing your father's plays? He never got very far with them. Only because the type wasn't right, darling. But now things are different. People are different. Not the people I've seen. What do you mean, Polly? Well, I certainly don't see the brotherly love you want me to believe in sweeping the world. Well, that's because you've just been shut up here in a big city. But believe me, Polly, where I've been, I see the difference. I've seen liberation in action, and it was something I'll never forget. Maybe you're right, Evan. Perhaps I'm wrong. Anyway, I'll wait until you get this big Broadway smash you're talking about underway. And then... And then, Polly, the day after the opening, you and I'll be married. Is it a deal? Cross my heart. It's a deal. <laughs> Youth and ambition were not to be denied. Evan Warner had accomplished the impossible, up to a point. By sheer determination, he'd gone out and raised the money to produce the first of his father's plays. It was called Tomorrow's Children. The night before the opening, Evan, Polly, and I had a private little celebration. And here's a toast to the best producer on Broadway. I second the motion. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously, Evan... I hope you have the biggest smash hit this town has ever seen. I say that as a friend. But don't be downhearted if it's a flop. It's a propaganda play. Well, I think the world is waiting for a moral and spiritual lift. And all I can say is that you're ready to give it to them, aren't you, Evan? Dad and I are, Polly. As you know, this show, Tomorrow's Children, depicts what life will be in a world as free as democracy can make it. I wonder if those millions of people you're worrying about would appreciate our way of life. Oh, just listen, Polly. Listen to the sage of the probate court saying that humanity is still the same old guy that wants to be led around by the nose. Well, I won't take sides in this argument. Let's all wait until tomorrow night. And then we'll know. Won't we, Evan? Yes. When the curtain comes down tomorrow night, we'll know. So be it. <laughs> Well, the critics all agree that it would have been better if tomorrow's children had never been born. The next morning, we got together and wept over the press notices. Evan was deeply hurt. 
Perhaps I'm crazy, but I'm going on. And Polly, I can't ask you to keep your promise to marry me. I'd hope for success, and instead I get black, dismal failure. But I can't compromise with truth. Polly, I... I want you to forget me. Marry someone with a future, with a good job. Someone who can get you the things you deserve. And thanks, both of you, for sticking with me. Goodbye. Well, what are you going to do with a fellow like Evan? Polly waited for another six months, and then, bright and early one morning, she called me to say she was married to Cyrus MacDonald, a wealthy mine owner from South Africa. Tired of waiting for Evan, she had chosen this way out. They left by plane that very night for their new home on the dark continent. I never knew how much Evan missed Polly until one day, months later, I dropped into the little cafe where they used to spend their evenings. During my luncheon, Emil, the head waiter, came over to my table. You know, Mr. O'Connell, it's a sad thing about Evan and Polly. Yes. She got married a few months back. You heard about it, didn't you? Yeah, 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 I know all about it. It's too bad, too. You know, those young people never missed a Saturday night down here when they were going together? Yes, I know. I came with them a few times. They always had the same table right over there in the corner. They used to hold hands and dream big dreams. Now everything is free. Emil, does uh, Evan ever come here anymore? That's the sad part about it. He still comes every Saturday night, just the same as usual. Has he a new girl? No, 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 not at all. He still reserves the same little table, has it set for two, orders two roses, and then he just sits there like, like a mummy. Orders a table for two and then comes here all alone, Emil? Exactly. He sits down, listens to the piano. You can see what he's thinking of. But he won't give in. If he would only cry a little, get a little bit sentimental, maybe he would forget. I don't think he's the forgetting kind, Emil. Yeah, maybe not, maybe not. Only, Mr. O'Connell, it makes me sick here at my stomach to see him suffer so. It makes me mad at the whole world, the world he is trying to save. Well, Emil, that's the way of life. Some of us were born to be happy, and some of us were born to suffer. I want to help Evan very much, but he swears he won't see me until he produces a hit. What are you going to do with a fellow like that? I don't know. But I'll tell you what I did, Mr. O'Connell. I've collected $2,465 from waiters all over town toward his next play. He's almost got enough now. How much more does he need, Emil? $3,000. And this time, Mr. O'Connell, it's going to be different. Different? How? He must have 10,000 investors in his new show. Everyone from paper boys to beauty shop operators. They've all kicked in all their pennies, and well, being investors, they will all show up at the theater. <laughs> <laughs> I see. With all those investors waiting to see their own show, <laughs> they ought to have a sellout for weeks to come. Yeah, that's right, Mr. <laughs> O'Connell, that's right. Well, in that case, Emil, I, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send you a check for $3,000. I want to be an angel and go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> but promise me that you'll never let him know it came from me. All right. <laughs> it's a deal, Mr. O'Connell. It's a deal. Part two of So Deep the Stream in just a moment. But first, a brief message from your announcer.
now back to So Deep the Stream with Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. I wish you could have attended the opening night of Evans' new show, So Deep the Stream. Even the aisles were jammed with a shouting mass of humanity who wanted to tell the world just what they thought of Evan Warner. And when the final curtain went down... Thank you, friends. Thank you. I made one big mistake in my life. I tried to produce a show for the people and by the people with money not of the people. It didn't work. This time, things are different. So Deep the Stream is your show. Yes, the story of your life. You, the bootblacks, you, the waiters and the steam fitters, you, the hairdressers and the seamstresses, you are the stream. I promise you that one day we'll have a people's theater where your own shows will be produced and financed by all of us. Yes, all of us with our pennies and nickels so that our message will be heard round the world. Our world. Our one world. <laughs> Evan Warner became the country's overnight sensation. Critics, sensing the popular movement, jumped on his bandwagon. Here was the great humanitarian, the new Lincoln. But others made over him, too. Others in the form and shape of lovely Pamela Hazelton. She lost no time in becoming friendly. Oh, Evan, darling, what you haven't done to us. But you know, I went downtown and applied for a job as a social worker this morning. Oh, I want to work right in the midst of the poor and underprivileged. But, Pamela, I don't want you to go that far. After all, the work is hard, tiring. What would you have me do, Evan? Just sit here in this penthouse apartment and wait for you to call me? Well, I could think of worse things. Selfish genius. That's what you are, too. Now that you've converted me to your way of thinking, you want me to be a drone bee. But you're too beautiful, my darling, to go into the slums. All right, my dear one. Pamela's ready to compromise. I'll stay away from social service work. If you'll take me to dinner at the Versailles tonight, and then we'll do the nightclubs. Now then, how's that? How could I resist, Pamela, dear? And one more thing. Yes, sweet? I've uh, scheduled you for the guest of honor at our next club meeting. All of my friends want to meet the young man who conquered Broadway single-handed. Why, they consider you a new Daniel. A new Daniel? <laughs> and a den full of lions, too. Social lions who think in terms of Rolls Royces and diamonds. It's not such a bad world, my darling. It offers many things your old world simply hasn't got. <laughs> and more, it offers connections. And I do so want you to do a new show. One of your own. Something more for the intelligentsia this time. Well, it's a thought. Maybe it's time I had a little nest egg, too. Everyone else seems to be getting them. Okay, we'll do it, Pamela. Of course we'll do it. Not long after, the engagement of Pamela and Evan was announced. Evan had deserted his ideal. He moved over to the swanky side of town. His name was mentioned almost daily in the society columns, but it was mentioned elsewhere, too. For example, in the little cafe on East 54th Street. Emil minced no words. Can you beat it? Can you beat it, Mr. O'Connor? Here his friends all over town had faith in him and his ideals. We came to his rescue, and he didn't have a friend or a red cent for that matter. And what happened? Success went to his head. So what does he do? Yes, yes, I know, Emil. But what he did has been done before and will be done again. That's what we can't figure out. Who is this Pamela girl? What has she got that she couldn't find in, well, say, Polly, for instance? Oh, yes, Polly. Hey, there was a fine girl. I wonder whatever happened to her. It's been months. Well, I heard from her less than a month ago. 
She's coming back here, didn't you know? No, she's never written to me. Well, her husband was killed in an airplane wreck oh. almost three months ago. She'll be here next month. Next month, eh? Maybe she'll be here in time for the opening of Evan's new show. <laughs> His new show. <laughs> that is very funny. The carriage trade better come out in droves. Because we won't be there, you can be sure of that. As soon as Polly arrived, she came over to see me. Pale and wan from the ordeal she'd been through. I thought I detected a gleam in her eye, the gleam of a crusader. I had to go out of the country, John, to see that Evan was right. What I saw in Africa, well, I hate to go into it. This tired old world does need another Lincoln, and I'm not fooling. Perhaps you're right, Polly. But what do you intend to do about it? I've told you what happened to Evan. He's to be married next month, you know. And he's sort of given up his, well, his crusade for humanity. John, listen. Evan wasn't the originator of this idea, was he? No, it goes back to his father, the original author. Yes, and if I remember correctly, his father had a whole trunk full of manuscripts. Where are they now? Still in the trunk, I guess. Evan hasn't much more use for them. Well, that's what I'm driving at. I read many of those shows. One in particular was called uh, Song of the Torch. Song of the Torch. I remember that one, too. It carried a powerful message. Satirical, but I thought it excellent. John, I want you to buy the rights to that show. Don't tell him who intends to finance it or, or who will produce it, but just, just get it at any price. I know that you are well able to finance it, Polly, but uh, whom do you have in mind to produce it? I'll tell you, John. The same people that made so deep the stream, the great hit that it was. The waiters, the boot blacks, the small fry. Yes, the people, John. Well, say, Polly, I think you've got something. Let the people do it. You're right. It's about them. Why not the, let them produce it? Good. I'll get busy right away, and maybe, well... Maybe what, John? Uh, maybe it will bring Evan back to his senses. Gee, I never thought lawyers could be so intuitive. Oh, maybe you're right. And here's hoping. I wondered how Evan felt about a month later when he read in the papers that the People's Theater Group was opening with the Song of the Torch. I wondered, too, how he felt when his new show, Gay Blade, financed adequately by his wealthy friends, closed after a week's run. His conscience must have bothered him because one afternoon he came to see me at my office. It's just one of those things, John. The story was weak, the direction even worse. I tried to hire Robert Light, but he was tied up in Hollywood. Yes, it's too bad, Evan. Tell me, how's tricks? You've certainly shied away from your old friends these past few months. Yeah, I know. But don't rub it in, John. You know how it is. Poor boy makes good wine, caviar. And, and Pamela? Oh, there's nothing wrong with Pamela, John. She's really fine, only... Only you're just beginning to learn that you were a fish out of water, eh, Evan? <laughs> I guess that's it. John, I've wanted to go back to the old crowd for months. My own people. Guys who learn life the hard way, but... It's hard to say, but I'm ashamed of myself. They... They think I'm a heel, and I guess they're right, John. Well, maybe it's not too late to make amends, Evan. No, what can I do to square myself? They won't forget or forgive. No, I wouldn't say that. You know, of course, that one of your father's plays is opening this week. Day after tomorrow, in fact. Yes, I read all about it. Oh. I wanted to drop into rehearsals, but, well, you know, they'd run me out of the theater. Tell you what I'll do, Evan. I'll reserve seats for the opening night. And you come with me. Come with you, boy? Oh, else will I? And, uh, thanks, Mr. Counselor. Thanks. <laughs> Song of the Torch played to an overflowing and enthusiastic audience. The program carried the name of no director, but that didn't stop the show from being a smash hit. From our seat in the third row, we saw and sensed the beginning of something that transcended art and the stage. We saw public opinion being welded by sheer force of dramatic intensity. As the curtain lowered, the people stormed their approval. Polly, Polly, who's he, John? Why, oh, I don't know. It must be the director or producer. Listen to him cheer. Why, it's Polly! 
Polly, John. It's our Polly. Stand up and cheer. It's Polly. She's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I didn't do much, honestly. All the credit for this, this, this great and wonderful show belongs to only two people. The first to Frank Warner, who wrote it. <laughs> and secondly, to the one and only Evan Warner, his son, who had the courage of his own convictions and who believed not only in his father, but in us, the people. Without either of them to show us the way, this show would never have played. And it gives me the greatest of pleasure tonight, ladies and gentlemen, to present to you the guiding star, the one who was always behind me in this glorious venture, Evan Warner. <laughs> Come up here, Evan. Come up here where you've always belonged. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you the rest of the probate cause of So Deep the Stream. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer. Here again is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. The People's Theatre Group is a thoroughly viral and potent influence on our lives today, thanks to Frank Warner and his son, Evan, and to Polly, Emil, and thousands of people who made it possible. Their message is the message of liberty and freedom. With Evan and Polly at the helm, you may confidently look ahead to a new movement in the theatre and perhaps in the shaping of a better world. <laughs> Next week, I'm going to tell you the true story about a mad miser who accumulated a pile of gold dust that was well worth over a million dollars. This miser hated the thought that he would have to leave this fortune to his heirs, so he conceived a plan whereby he willed the gold to his relatives, <laughs> but made sure they wouldn't have the pleasure of spending it. We call this interesting story, Miser's Gold. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Robert Webster Lake. Any similarity between names used in this story and those of living persons is purely coincidental. Strange Wills is a Teleways feature produced in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs>